Good afternoon. Extra one today. I'm heading home from the conference. I've dropped off my work colleague and uh, I'm stuck in traffic. So, might as well continue. Now, I was thinking after this morning, I had yesterday's video where I talked about basically the information being that all being all that you need to have really to play um, and that everything else could come later and then from there I jumped on in to explain the kind of the basic stats of the game the ability scores um, I've actually realized I want to take a step back from there because what I neglected to discuss which probably should have really come before the the ability scores even is the types of character that you can play. Now, <coughs> I suppose there is some argument for this coming after the ability scores because this part does vary. Um, the ability scores are pretty much the same. But your character, one of the key things to think about the main aspects that will make up your character in Dungeons and Dragons, the main things that you need to know to think about who this person is going to be, and remember what I said in the first video, this is all about finding a different person. This is about building a character that is not you, but who you will take on the role of. Now, there's two key elements that we, as people, don't normally think of that are integral to D&D characters, and that is the character's class and race. Now, I'll get into classes afterwards. I'm going to start with race. Obviously, we're all human. I'm assuming we're all human. If there's any of the, any aliens watching this now, please make contact because that would be really cool. Um, assuming none of you do, and assuming no one's putting the video on for their dog or cat to watch, we're all human. In Dungeons and Dragons, it's a bit more complicated than that. As you see in Lord of the Rings, as you see in fantasy literature of all kinds. D&D &D is a world made up of, hold on, and I'm back, phone call to talk about the conference today. Um, so where was I? Yes, race in D&D, &D. much more complicated than here on Earth. Um, Dungeons and Dragons, you've seen it in Lord of the Rings, you've seen it in fantasy of all sorts, you have a lot of other choices. Now, many of these choices come with built-in stereotypes. For better or for worse, um, there are certain things that these other races are viewed as being. And that can change based on the DM. Uh, your dungeon master, the person running the game, can alter that from world to world and from game to game. They are not set in stone, um, but they are aspects which are quite common across a large number of themes and which are taken as the default unless you're told otherwise. So what other options are there? I'm not going to try to go through every single option because there are a lot, especially when you get into people that add their own. Uh, but there are a few core ones that are worth mentioning. First you have the dwarves. The dwarves are a short, often stout race. Um, they usually are defined either as hill dwarves or mountain dwarves. 
In most cases, not all, but most, mountain dwarves are considered to be the high society of dwarves. Hill dwarves are usually considered to be lesser. Uh, dwarves are seen as having a fasc fascination with stonework and stonecraft and jewelry, uh, precious gems. Um, they're also seen to be uh, very good craftsmen, but not necessarily the most artistic bunch. Um, their personalities are normally depicted as gruff, um, dour, serious, and very much matter of fact. Things are as they are, and we either accept them as they are, or we do something about it. Um, they're normally depicted as having long, flowing beards, often unkept hair. Um, dwarves are very often considered to be the epitome of function over appearance. Moving on then from the dwarves, we have the exact opposite. We have the elves. Now the elves, as you will have seen in most fantasy worlds, are depicted as tall, graceful, slender, beautiful beings with long pointed ears um, that are very long lived and tend to devote a higher than average amount of time to art and beauty and are often depicted as appearance over function. Um, as with the dwarves, the elves also have different groups. Now, these are often referred to as High Elves and Wood Elves. I've always found it a bit interesting that Dwarves have a mountain or hill. Elves have Wood, which is also a location. But then the other one is simply High Elves. They don't live high. I don't know why, why that came about as it did, but um, High Elves are normally considered to be the upper caste of Elven society. They are Elves that live in grand, beautiful cities. Um, even though they are often cities in the forest, um, the depictions in the Lord of the Ring movies are brilliant examples of, you know, the beauty and kind of the natural setting of elven architecture. Wood elves are considered to be more uncouth. They are more, um, they are less refined. They're hunters, they're uh, villagers, they're not city elves. They don't have these grand vistas that the high elves have. Um, you will also hear other terms thrown around. Uh, sun Elves is often used in place of High Elves. Um, moon Elves is sometimes used in place of Wood Elves. Um, you also, with both the Dwarves and the Elves, have an extra group, which is usually not playable. I say usually because there are some de uh, some DMs who allow them, and and some players who like to use them, and those are the dark variants of each race. Um, the dark dwarves, known as the Durgar, uh, are basically a traditionally evil-minded set of. Um, dwarves which live deep under the mountain. They're, they're the ones that live in the places that light doesn't get to. 
Um, you also then have the Dark Elves, also referred to as the Drow, uh, who again live underground and often live their entire lives without seeing the sun. They're also traditionally evil-minded and are normally seen as villains by most people. Now then, after the Elves and Dwarves, we'll then move on to the other race that you will probably be familiar with if you're coming at this from Lord of the Rings, and that is the Halflings. Now, whether you call them Halflings or Hobbits or whatever other name you like to put on them, they are traditionally a small, light-footed, often very cheerful and generous race. Um, the other thing that you miss out on in Tolkien, but the other small race, is the gnomes. Now, some people wonder why there is a difference between gnomes and halflings. They're both small races that on the surface would appear to be quite similar. The main difference is that your halfling races tend to be small and quick, very dexterous, very um, light-footed. Your gnomes don't typically have a reputation for being light-footed. Uh, they more have a tendency towards scholarly pursuits. Uh, they are your, your small, intelligent race. Uh, not to say that halflings can't be smart, but they're not known for it the way gnomes are. Uh, in a lot of worlds, gnomes are typically your inventors, your innovators, your, um, your race that's responsible for creating new things. Now then, we've covered dwarves, we've covered elves, gnomes and halflings, of course, you can still be a human. There's nothing to say that you can't play a human in D&D. Um, they are kind of a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. They don't get the same kind of specialty benefits that some of the other races do. Um, they get kind of more generalist features. Um, I tend to think that if you're going to play a fantasy game... Play something a bit fantasy. I've never been a real big fan of bunches of humans. Unless it's a specific type of game world that calls for it. Um, what else have you got? I mean, those are, those are kind of your primary races. Then you start getting into other things like Dragonborn. Dragonborn, as they sound, are basically uh, two-arm, two-leg... Walking, talking, dragon people. They're not dragon-sized. They're human-sized. Maybe a bit bigger than humans. Strongman-sized, maybe. Um, but they have the features of dragons, of reptiles. Um, depending on the world, they're either accepted as normal members of society, or in some cases they are outcasts, or... Um, feared for whatever reason. Um, that does vary from world to world and from game to game. One nifty thing about the Dragonborn is that they do have the ability to have a breath weapon. Whether that means that they can breathe fire or spit acid or whatever the effect may be. Uh, it's a nifty ability to have. Usually not that powerful, but impressive, at least for show. You also then have a couple half races. Now, the halves are basically representing the fact that humans are jack of all trades, master of none, and they tend to get everywhere and get involved with everyone. Um, I think that's about the politest way I can say that. So you have half-elves. Obviously 
human elf get together, you get a half elf. They have some of the dexterity and grace of the elves, but not all of it. Uh, but then they have some of the fluid kind of um, jack of all trades of a human, but again, not all of it. They sit in between. You also have half orcs. Now, we haven't talked about orcs because they're usually not considered to be a playable race, but if you've watched Lord of the Rings, if you've watched World of Warcraft, uh, you know what an orc is. Big, mean, scary, often green. No, I'm not talking about the Hulk, but the idea would pretty much fit even if I was. Um, orcs. Now, even though they are considered villains, oftentimes half-orcs are playable characters. The story could be that orcs raped and pillaged a village and left a, left a human woman pregnant. Um, it doesn't have to be the product of something, you know, detrimental, but it often is. It's d and um, But half orcs, yes. And for the most part, starting out as a player, I would say it's going to be one of those races that you're going to probably play first. There are others. You'll hear Tiefling, which are basically, without getting too complicated, part human, part demon. Not necessarily as cool as it sounds. Um, and then, depending on the game, there are other options. Personally, I wouldn't recommend them for a first player, a first character. Stick with the stick with the basics. Don't get too complicated to start with. Anyway, as you can see from the recording, I'm currently reversing up my drive. I've made it home. So we've covered the races. We've covered the ability scores. We've covered kind of the beginnings of the thought process involved in playing. Tomorrow, maybe we'll talk about classes. And we'll see where that takes us. Anyway, like, subscribe. Have a brilliant day. And by all means, if you're not involved in a game, get involved somewhere. It can't harm. You know, you'll find that you enjoy it, even if you don't know everything about it. Have a great day.